Okay, you may be seated. Now, our speaker is uh, someone I'm most grateful happens to be here at Westmont College as our provost. Uh, Mark Sargent graduated from UCSB, uh, married a Westmont graduate, and uh, his kids, uh, or two of them anyway. Or, no, just two. Yeah, went to Westmont, and the other to Gordon. Uh, he's been a, a provost at Gordon College for 16 years. Before that, he served as an academic officer at Spring Arbor and at Biola. Uh, he has a degree in American history, has been awarded for his research on uh, at William Bradford, and he's just a, a great gift to this, this college here. Um, I told Mark early on, uh, before he even knew me and knew uh, how silly I can be, that uh, I really don't like meetings. I like them well run. And I don't think he was trying to impress me. I just want you to know he runs a really good meeting. But Mark, you're a wonderful man, and uh, we're eager to hear you this morning. Let's welcome Mark Sargent, our provost. Thank you, Ben. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to close my uh, remarks today by referring to candles. So I asked the chapel office if I could light this candle for this morning's service. They said it'd be fine to do as long as I put it in the appropriately safe spot. So I think X marks the spot right there. Oh. <laughs> I figured it'd get some groans, yeah. Did you enjoy spring sing? Congratulations to the winning team. Are they here today? Uh, I guess they take that uh, off-campus thing pretty seriously. Mm. I do want to thank the off-campus team, though, for letting me have a line in the script. Uh, of course, I don't know what to make of the fact that they give the provost the stupidest thing that's been said at the Academy Awards uh, for many years to say. But in honor of that, uh, I've chosen to start my comments this morning with a few thoughts about the movies. Eventually, though, I will get to Easter in our anticipation for the resurrection. Uh, first, as long as I'm congratulating winners, let me say that uh, we've had a year of many outstanding winners at Westmont, from students and staff. I was in the shower this morning trying to think of all of them, and my five-minute timer ran out of time before I could, uh, <laughs> before I could list them all. So, so I'll just mention a few. Uh, Lisa Hodges, Lisa Hodges, national champion, women's soccer team, champions of character, Pirates of Penzance, one of three best musicals, every team that beat Biola. Uh, and this Friday, I hope you come because we're going to celebrate many academic accomplishments at our annual academic convocation. But many of the most important wins that we have don't come with trophies or prizes. They come in the small epiphanies, private moments of self-discovery, and greater vision, clarity, and empathy. And one of the wins this year at Westmont has been a story about the movies, a small community of staff members who have assembled frequently to watch films with themes about racial division and social complexities. They've called their group Across Color Lines. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite two members of that group, our legal counsel, Toya Cooper, and Clark R.D. Leaf Nunley, to step up here with me and share a few perspectives on what they learned about that experience. A few comments to frame their remarks. Several years ago, shortly after he won the top prize at the Cannes Film Festival, the famous Iranian filmmaker Abbas Kiristami said, I used to think that they turned the lights out in the theater so that we could see the screen better. I now realize that there is another purpose, and that is to isolate ourselves from one another. In many ways, watching film is an isolating experience. It's a very private one. I'm a contemplative person. Uh, I enjoy being alone. I enjoy being alone with my thoughts in a theater and having the darkness provide me some cover to shield me from those around me. And of course, our technologies have made the isolation of watching film even more common. You can now watch film on your laptop or your wristwatch. Is there anyone here who's not watched a film on a iPad or a smartphone? Some of you may be watching one now, for all I know. 
But if technology has given us more freedom to select the films and the occasions when we view them, film continues to be an art form that pervades our conversations. One of the threads that links a community or a generation. It's also a window on other communities and cultures and people's experiences. So even though we have that momentary darkness in the theater, we are never really fully convinced we are alone. We are alone, yet together. We retreat into our private space, but emerge with a wider sense of the world and the people around us. And that, in many ways, epitomizes the experience that our film group had. So let me, at this time, invite Toya and Leif to come forward and, and share just a few thoughts about what they learned from the, the experience. Let's welcome Toya and Leif as they come up here. Yeah. I want you to both comment just briefly on what prompted you to get involved uh, with, the, with the program. Yeah, Leif? Well, um, for any of you that know Toya, she's a woman that commands great respect. So when Toya asks you to do something, you, you tend to do it. And so um, for me, Toya has been an incredible friend here over the two years that I've been here. And so when she asked me, it was more than just the respect. It was really that friendship I had that I knew this was something important. So when I received the invitation, it said, you know, 10 people, six films, and then there was a promise of home-cooked meal every Thursday night. Um, I was inclined to go. But why I went the first time is very different than why I continued going. Um, it only took one time being there, watching a film with these people, that I really saw the power in what um, Mark was saying. We were alone watching these films, but there was something in that moment that made me realize this was a very powerful um, experience that I was going to have, and not something that I even realized walking into it how powerful it was going to be. Good morning. Uh, I was looking for creative ways to continue thinking about a topic that we can often get a kind of discussion fatigue around. Um, and movies are just one of the ways that I learn best, uh, and I think one of the ways that I sort of engage with people. Uh, so Mariah Velasquez and I, and if you don't know Mariah, you should know her, she's fantastic. Mm -hmm. She is the assistant to the vice president for administration and planning. We put our heads together and thought, hey, what about a movie group uh, where we could think critically about some of these things that we think we have, edit have every thought you could possibly have on? Um, and what it shows me and continues to show me is just because I've thought about something a lot doesn't mean I've thought about it well. Uh, it doesn't mean that I've thought about it with other people and engaged in it in a way that's critical. Um, and that's the way that we're sort of trying to, you know, teach y'all to do it here. That's why you spend four years here. So um, that's why we started this group. Good. Can you comment a little bit on what, uh, what you learned that you did not expect? Uh, what surprised you and what moved you? Some way, please. Um, so Toya mentioned this, this idea of discussion fatigue, you know, and having gone through grad school in the last uh, few years where we had a class on, on uh, diversity and having gone through some discussions with RAs every year, I found myself having this discussion fatigue. And what I didn't expect, what I didn't um, realize was going to happen is how powerful the medium of movies was in helping me be able to engage in this discussion in meaningful ways and also to give me tools to be able to talk to others, like my family, my friends, that aren't a part of this discussion and don't have this discussion fatigue, but maybe are, are fatigued from what they hear in the media and everything else. And what I realized was a lot what Mark said when he mentioned this, that this experience of film is doing something alone yet together. Um, that's what I found. So as a white man you know, who came from a middle class family, I am able to step away from this conversation. You know, so I can engage in the conversation um, cognitively, but sometimes it's hard for me because I'm very aware of my own reactions. I don't want my reactions to offend anyone else. I don't want my questions to offend um, a, you know, someone of color who I'm having these discussions with, but I'm very genuinely curious and want to know and be able to engage. And what I found with the medium of film, and the films in particular that we used, is that I was able to engage fully without being self-conscious about my reactions because we were all engaging in the same experience at that time. And for me, it was a very transformative experience. I have taken several of these films and with people that I wouldn't necessarily have conversations with because I'm not sure how they'll respond, I've recommended these films to them as well and hope to be able to have conversations with them in the future. Um, and so again, sometimes there's this, this fear in me of I don't know what I can do to help further this conversation that I know is so important because I don't feel like I fully understand it always myself. And this experience 
really helped me to have a, a much greater understanding. So I encourage you all, if you have the opportunity to experience this conversation through film, um, take that opportunity. Surprised? Was that mm -hmm. what surprised Surprised, me? what moved you? I think I was surprised by how invigorated I was by the discussion. Um, we keep talking about this discussion fatigue that happens around these issues, and you know, contrary to what might be popular belief, folks of color get tired of talking about it too. So, um, you know, there, there, however, it, it's a different kind of tired, I, I think. You know, there are sort of in my embodiment as a black woman in Santa Barbara in the hills of Montecito in the profession that I'm in, I am a conversational point on the subject all day long, every day. So getting tired of it for me is a little different. Um, but there's also a sense for me, uh, there was before this group, and this is the part that surprised me, is that I just needed to get used to that. And I was used to it in a lot of ways. It's a kind of low-level hum of anxiety that you kind of live with, right? Um, and you just got to wait till Jesus comes <laughs> for it to get better. But surprisingly for me, being with this group shifted that for me a little bit. And it said to me that you think that's how it has to be. It doesn't have to. And this group is going to teach you that. I'm going to show you more of who I am as God in this world with these people that you don't think can show you that it doesn't have to be the way that you think it is and that you've experienced it is um, in the days that you've walked and had your being in the world. So that's, that's what surprised me. Okay. Lee Ventoya, thank you very much for coming and sharing and for the good work that you've done with that. Thank you. Actually, actually when I heard about their experiences with the films, I, I thought of some of the similarities at times between being in a community that watches a film and being in a community that worships, especially at a Christian college. We gather regularly in the, in the semi-darkness of this room, and in that darkness, we are allowed a sense of privacy, a meditative space. And as a community, we do value inwardness and reflection. We value independence of judgment and thought. But we're also conscious of others, and we hope that being together also enhances our capacity to understand, to affirm, to explore, and to, to celebrate uh, the things that bind us together, uh, those things that we can affirm and those things that we long for. And in my time, I want to mention two things that I think distinguish a community that is alone yet together, a community of worship is a community that learns to wait. Waiting, I know, is difficult. Uh, we expect instant, instant knowledge, instant gratification. I absolutely hate standing in lines. Uh, when I get in traffic jams on the freeway, I'd rather drive five or eight miles around a different way just to feel like I'm moving uh, than to sit there. And our scripture is full of waiting. Think of David's cries in the Psalms. Think of the prophetic books. They're telling of stories, of centuries of waiting from one generation to another to escape exile, to, to see a day of salvation or renewal. And I know that people enter this room in different stages of their personal journey. Some of you are here with great confidence and joy in what you believe. You have a strong sense of calling. Others of you, frankly, are here with great doubt and skepticism and uncertainty. I think there's enormous power sometimes when we recognize that the experience of worship isn't forcing a normative experience on every single person, but allowing us to be individuals in our journey before God and waiting and walking along each other's side as we go forward. Being together with the questions sometimes over the long journey. I think of Jesus at Gethsemane. He knew that his disciples could not, constant, could not in any way uh, know the burden or the cosmic scope of his prayers and what he was facing. But he wanted them to wait with him and watch with him. He wanted that companionship. Our Lord wanted someone by his side at that moment. We wanted the compassion of being together. A few years ago, I went through a really challenging time in my own professional life life in my own professional career. And you could say in some ways it was a, it was a kind of uh, time of confusion. And, and here I am, provost, a professional, 
And one of my colleagues, a veteran teacher of religious studies, noticed it. He was quite a bit older than I was. He was about 75 years old. He had every reason to come in and give me advice, but he said, I simply want to come in and sit with you occasionally. And he'd come in, he'd listen, he'd let me share his reflections, he'd read a psalm, he'd read a poem, he knew I liked poetry, I'm an English major, and he would pray quietly for me. And he did it week after week after week. He had confidence that in time, the Lord was going to help me through this challenge, and he wanted to wait with me during this process. We need the discipline of staying with the questions, the practice of waiting with each other. The issues that Leif and Toya looked at in their films require a long tension on the part of people addressing them. They're not just immediate problems that can be addressed in a film night. They're issues that require us to deal with questions that will take generations and decades to unravel. And we need to develop the habits of perseverance with some of these questions. Sometimes I think in an evangelical culture we expect instant answers. Uh, and we need to cultivate the habit of waiting with one another. The kinds of social reconciliation that's possible only can take place when we have that patience and perseverance. I think that great chapter in, um, in Isaiah 40, I, lo I love the mo moment in the movie Chariots of Fire. I know it's an older film, but some of you have seen it. Where Eric Little steps into the pulpit in this Scottish church in France and reads about waiting on the Lord to renew his strength. That comes in Isaiah 40. It's well through the book. There are two centuries of waiting before we get the comment about wait on the Lord and your strength will be renewed. That time. There are issues of personal restoration and spiritual assurance. For those of you that uh, are anticipating graduating uh, here in the near future or, or just frankly anticipating graduating, I think that's most of you, uh, one thing that I really cherish about Christian colleges is the way in which your faculty will wait with you after graduation. Some people will leave with uncertainty about their sense of calling, maybe even still finding their sense of place. And I've seen extraordinary stories of those faculty, of faculty members and those students continuing to talk over generations. And somewhere 20 years later, there's a moment of discovery, a reaffirmation, a renewal that takes place because of the relationship and trust of waiting together in this time of worship. A second point, being alone together helps waken our imagination. Sometimes we think of imagination as a retreat into a private world. It's actually a time when imagination can be a re-envisioning of what is possible. To be in a film group, like they were talking about, requires just not retreating into it as a kind of private experience, like I saw a film and it stirred me and it moved me, but it requires us to imagine new possibilities that we could overcome some of those challenges. It requires being alone with your reflections, but being together as a spark. I've always been struck by the, uh, the writings of Margaret Nussbaum on the, the concept of the moral imagination. And her argument is that the our capacity for empathy needs imagination. Our capacity to identify with others needs the ability for us to imagine ourselves in somebody else's place. But the imagination is fueled by empathy because until we encounter other people's experiences and their challenges, the spur for us to be engaged in re-envisioning what the world can be will be less. It's a phrase from the, uh, from the, from the theologian Richard Hayes, who's taught at Duke, that I've always liked. He talks about one of the great challenges of the Christian life is to live in imaginative obedience to the moral vision of the New Testament. By that he means that the full obedience that we practice is not simply a, just a routine devotion to a set of habits, but the full engagement of our imagination in trying to envision a world more like Christ would like it to be. At no time am I as conscious of this blend of being alone and yet together than during the season of preparation for Easter. In fact, in recent years, there's been one service on Monday, Thursday, that's actually made me think at times of the movies and of that Kiristami quote about being isolated from one another in darkness. I'm going to close with a story about this. Uh, 
Ben mentioned my 16 years at Gordon. I moved here from Massachusetts a few years ago. We attended church there in a very old wooden congregational church. The church was actually founded by the Puritans in 1691. In the basement of the church, there were actually documents about the Salem witchcraft trials. The church building that we were in was built shortly after the American Revolution. The members gathered a bunch of coins and spoons and jewelry and brought it down to Paul Revere's foundry in Boston, and he cast an 800-pound bell that still rings from the church every Sunday morning. Paul Revere's shop also made a chalice that is still used by the church every Monday, Thursday during Holy Week. The chalice is brought out on that Thursday. It's the day that commemorates the Last Supper, the night when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, the night when he prayed in Gethsemane, and they did not wait with him. And that evening in that small congregation gathered, not in an upper room, but in the basement, about dusk, the only light in the room would be candles. There was no sermon, no talk from a provost. We sat together in a circle and read the Passion story together. Much of the occasion was simply being together with the words of the Gospels. After each reader finished his or her portion of the text, another candle was extinguished until all was dark. We lingered for a moment in darkness and then left in silence. A darkness and silence that signaled that we were still waiting for Easter. I found those moments of darkness profoundly moving. It was a time of being alone yet together. As various readers came forward, we knew their stories. Some had broken families, some had lost loved ones. Some were battling sickness and drugs, unemployment, depression, and loneliness. Yet sitting in there in the darkness was a reminder that we are often called just to be present, to wait with them, even sometimes when we're not certain of the way forward or where the Lord might take us. But I also could not sit in this community without being inspired by its aspirations and compassion. There were hospice nurses, social workers, a fundraiser for hospitals in the developing world, teachers, construction workers that went all the way down to Louisiana to rebuild hurricane-damaged homes in poor neighborhoods. And when the final candle was extinguished, it was a reminder that all of us true, still truly need the victory at Easter to make all things right. But it was impossible to sit there in private reflection and not feel the great hope that called us together in that basement, the great hope of the resurrection, which had awakened new and imaginative ways of being present in our world and in the lives of others. I left in darkness but with a rekindled sense of hope, Easter hope. On Monday, today, I enjoyed listening as Michael Schausberger led us in, in the choral refrain, the choral anthem. And for me, there was a meditative quality to it, a solace, a quiet, an inward sense of consolation. But I was also aware that such meditative space was made possible by the harmony of a great number of voices around me. Michael, come share with us our benediction. Thanks.